Hey folks, Wally Diem here, and today we're going to take a look at a character build for the Fathomless Warlock. Now, if you're familiar with my builds, I don't build on optimization, but more around theme and having fun with a character. So in today's build, we're going to concentrate on enemy movement, whether that's pushing them back, reducing their movement speed, or things of that nature. We're also going to take a little bit of a sub-theme with regards to our patron. And since the Fathomless Warlock is a character that is more along with the C and something along those lines, I want to use a character or a patron from the Magic the Gathering lore, and that would be Rexiel the Risen Deep. That is a legendary Kraken and one of my favorite cards from uh, Magic's history. I used to have a few decks built on Rexiel the Risen Deep. Now, if you're not playing in an aquatic game, that's fine. You can still use this character. There's absolutely nothing to this character that's going to prevent you from using it outside of a ocean or some type of a sea or water campaign. You're perfectly fine to use this in any game that you want. And of course, I do need to mention that if you'd like to see the written version of this character build, I did put an article up on my website, walladm.com. You can find a link to that in the description below. It'll have a lot of the options that we cover today in written form, as well as two or three of the different character levels in a PDF if you'd like to download them and take a look at them. So with that being stated, let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to my Shatterkai Fathomless Warlock. Demira. Now, before we get over the options that I chose as far as level one is concerned, let's go over the Fathomless Warlock subclass itself. Now, again, this is a subclass that is more of an ocean theme with our patron being a kraken or some type of ancient water elemental. Again, I have chosen Rexiel the Risen Deep from Magic the Gathering, but you do not have to play this in a sea campaign. This works just fine with no problem whatsoever in a land campaign. Now, you see here we have the expanded spell list and there are quite a few different spells on here now these are not spells that we always know some subclasses you get to add these and you always have them memorized or ready to use that is not the case for the fathomless warlock all this spell list or expanded spell list is doing is it's adding these two spells that we can choose and as a warlock we get a decent amount of spells that we know but we only get a couple spell slots and we will pick a few of these down the road but again these aren't ones that we always know they're just there for us to choose from when we get to that level. Now, one of the first level abilities of the Fathomless Warlock and the ability that we are going to build around with our theme is Tentacle of the Deeps. You can magically summon a spectral tentacle that strikes at your foes. As a bonus action, you create a 10 foot long tentacle at a point you can see within 60 feet of you. The tentacle lasts for one minute or until you use this feature to create another one. When you create the tentacle, you can make a melee spell attack against one creature within 10 feet of it. On a hit, the target is going to take 1d8 cold damage and its speed is reduced by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. Now, as a bonus action on our turn, we can move the tentacle up to 30 feet and repeat the attack. You can summon the tentacle a number of times equal to our proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So I'm digging this subclass already. We get a tentacle that we can create at levels 1 through 4. We can do this twice per day and it's going to deal 1d8 of cold damage. And if you'll notice, there's no way for them to destroy it. There's no armor class, no hit points. It's just going to be there as an effect of us being a fathomless warlock. And of course, when the tentacle of the deeps hits a target, it's going to reduce their speed by 10 feet until the start of our next turn. And that's going to be our theme for the character. We're going to manipulate how the enemy or how creatures can move. And then before we move on, just to point out that this does require our bonus action to be able to move the tentacle and repeat the attack. So that's going to affect some of these spell selections that we make along the way. Now, the other ability we get at first level is Gift of the Sea. You gain a swimming speed of 40 feet and you can breathe underwater. Now, this is a really neat ability, but if we were to play on theme with an aquatic creature such as a Triton or a Water Genasi, then those creatures already have a swimming speed and an underwater breathing ability. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to pick a race that doesn't have either one of those features, has a lot of things that I like about it, and is going to gain these. So I'm going to pick a race or a species that is going to gain the swimming effect and gain the ability to breathe underwater rather than already have it like the Water Genasi or the Triton. 
And so the race that I chose was the Shatterkai. So with the Shatterkai, we are a humanoid. We're going to be medium size and we have a movement speed of 30 feet. The Shatterkai gives us an ability called Blessing of the Raven Queen as a bonus action. You can magically teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space you can see. You can use this trait a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Now starting at third level, we gain resistance to all damage when we teleport using this trait. The resistance lasts until the start of our next turn and during that time we appear ghostly and translucent. So this is an amazing ability that mirrors Misty Step and Misty Step is one of my favorite spells in the game and with Blessing of the Raven Queen we basically get that effect and we don't have to use any of our spell slots. We don't have to sacrifice any of our spells known to be able to get Misty Step and we don't have to get the Fate Touch feat to ensure that we get Misty Step. We have it as a race. We'll be able to use it twice from levels one through four and then once our proficiency bonus goes up at level five we'll be able to use it three times. Not only that but better than Misty Step once we hit third level once we teleport using this trait then we're going to have the resistance to all damage and that's just absolutely amazing and puts it over the top. I, I think Shatterkai is probably one of my favorite races now, and you can find the updated version of it in the Monsters of the Multiverse on D&D Beyond. Now, as a Shatterkai elf, we come from the Shadowfell, and that's kind of what I'm going to tie my backstory in, is the Raven Queen and Rexiel, the Risen Deep, are going to work out a deal. We're going to go from the Shadowfell, maybe we went into the sea and plunged there, Rexiel seen something in us, and now we serve Rexiel, but we still serve the Raven Queen as well. Maybe there's a, a joint custody agreement there, as far as as far as far Demira is concerned. Uh, we also get Dark Vision out to 60 feet as a Shatterkai elf. We have Fey Ancestry, which gives us advantage on saving throws we make to avoid the or in the charm condition on herself. We have Keen Senses, which is going to give us proficiency in perception, which is one of the best skills in the game. We have Necrotic Resistance because we are from the Shadowfell, so we will have resistance to necrotic damage. That's pretty good. And we have Trance, which is usually the same with all elves. We don't need to sleep and magic cannot put us to sleep. And we can finish a long rest in four hours if we spend those hours in a trance-like meditation during which we will retain consciousness. Now, one of the cool things about the Shatterkai elf that differentiates it from the elf that you would find in the player's handbook is at the end of our trance or our long rest, we can switch our two proficiencies. So as you see here, I'm starting off with Jeweler's Tool and proficiency in the trident weapon but after a long rest i can switch that to a different weapon type i can have like an herbalism kit and a dice set i can have an herbalism kit and cartographer's tools cartographer's tools and a great axe or glass blower's tools you name it we get to switch those after every long rest and i absolutely love this but for now, I'm going to stick with Jeweler's Tools because Demira is going to be fascinated with gems and jewels that you would find in the depths of the ocean, something like pearls and things of that nature. And I'm also going to stick with the Trident because even though we're not going to be using the weapon a lot, I still want her to be proficient in it and carry it around to signify her loyalty to our patron, the Kraken, Rexiel the Risen Deep. Now, as far as our ability scores are concerned for Demira, I used the point by system to give us a 15 in charisma and then use that plus two modifier to give us a 17. I put a 15 into, de into dexterity, gave us that plus one modifier to put us at 16, which is going to give us an armor class of 15. I went ahead and took the liberty of giving us a studded leather armor, maybe using the gold buy. And then I have a 14 in constitution to beef up our hit points just a little bit. Wisdom comes in at a 10, and Intelligence and Strength are our dump stats. Now for our skills, we're going to be proficient in Perception because of the Shatterkai ability. We're also going to be proficient in Nature and Intimidation from being a Warlock. And then I chose the Faceless background, and Faceless is going to give us proficiency in Deception, and since we already have Intimidation, I'm able to choose any other skill, and I chose Acrobatics. I'm a firm believer of always choosing at least Acrobatics or Athletics if given the opportunity. Now let's take a look at our spells, and as a reminder, the Warlock doesn't get a lot of spell slots. However, they do refill those after a short rest, so it's going to be dependent on your DM as to how many 
short rest that you're allowed per day. Usually it's at least one or two, but of course that's going to vary from playgroup to playgroup. Starting at level one, we're only going to have one spell slot per day, and then we're going to have two per day, and that's going to take us all the way up to 11th level. So our spell slots are going to be very precious to us. So the spells that I did choose at level one for our cantrips, we get two of them. I wanted one that's going to be a ranged attack and another one that would include a saving throw. So I chose Eldritch Blast, of course, because we're playing a warlock and we're going to choose some invocations that are going to go along with it. And then I've also chosen Frostbite. And I chose Frostbite because of the cold damage. And if the saving throw is failed, then whatever creature is hit by the Frostbite is going to have disadvantage on the next weapon attack roll it makes before the end of its next turn. So that it could include a reaction or attack of opportunity if we're trying to get away from something. We could use our Frostbite if they fail the saving throw and then we try to get away. They're going to have disadvantage on that attack of opportunity. Now, as we level up and get access to more cantrips, I'll probably pick more utility spells. Now, with regards to our first level spells, the first one that I chose is Arms of Hadar, and this fits right in with our Fathomless Warlock as far as our theme is concerned. So with Arms of Hadar, this is going to erupt from ourself, and it's going to be a 10-foot radius. You invoke the power of Hadar the Dark Hunger. Tendrils of dark energy erupt from you and batter all creatures within 10 feet of you. Each creature in that area must make a strength saving throw. On a failed save, a target's going to take 2d6 necrotic damage and cannot take reactions until the next turn. On a successful save, the creature takes half damage but suffers no effect. So this is going to be a great way if we're surrounded by a bunch of combatants. We will probably refer to our arms of Hadar, blast it out, and hopefully get a bunch of failed saving throws. The other first level spell that I chose is Hex. Now Hex is going to compete with our Tendrils of the Deep ability, which requires our bonus action. But at this point, we can first level Hex, and then we can activate our Tendrils of the Deep the following turn. Because Hex does not require our bonus action going forward, so the way that we could start combat at the lower levels is first round Hex, second round Tendrils of the Deep. And with Hex, is what we're doing is we're placing a curse on a creature that we can see within range and until the spell ends whenever we damage them with our eldritch blast or an attack it's going to deal an extra d6 and necrotic damage but not only that we get to choose an ability and they'll have disadvantage on ability checks using that chosen ability hex goes a lot hand in hand with most warlocks and eldritch blasts but the future of this character is going to see both of these first level spells disappear as we level up and get into our third and fourth level spells but for the lower levels we will be using a lot of Hex and Arms of Hadar. So wrapping up our combat attacks, as you can see, our Eldritch Blast is going to have 120 foot range, plus five to hit, a D10 of damage, and Arms of Hadar, centered on herself, will require a strength saving throw of DC 13, and will cause 2D6 of necrotic damage, or half as much on a failed save. Our Tentacle of the Deeps is down here with Hex. In our bonus actions category, we get a plus five, it's got a 10 foot reach, and it's gonna do a D8 plus three of cold damage. And of course, don't forget, as a Shatter Kai, we've got our blessing of the raven queen so we can basically cast misty step twice per long rest so that's going to do it for demira our shatter kai warlock at level one let's advance to level two and pick our invocations so here we are back on DD beyond with demira our second level fathomless warlock now at second level we get to choose two warlock invocations and invocations are like magical abilities to the warlock they help offset the limited number of spell slots. So the Eldritch Invocations that I chose, the first one is Agonizing Blast. This is a very popular choice and it's going to help us with regards to damage. And this reads, when you cast Eldritch Blast, add plus three to the damage it deals on a hit. That plus three is my Charisma bonus. So when my Charisma bonus goes up, so when it goes up to an 18, it'll be a plus four. So Eldritch Blast is plus our Charisma modifier. The second ability that I have for the Eldritch Invocation is going to be Repelling Blast. Now this is going to go into our theme of moving creatures around and Repelling Blast reads, when you hit a creature with Eldritch Blast, you can push the creature up to 10 feet away from you in a straight line. Now this is really cool in our lower levels, we cast Eldritch Blast, we're gonna do an extra three points of damage and we can push those creatures back 10 feet. But think about it when we reach fifth level and we have two beams for our Eldritch Blast, Class, then that's going to be plus three damage per hit and 10 feet per hit. So 
Repelling Blast and Agonizing Blast are going to work very well together for us. And of course, let's not forget that as we're moving them back 10 feet, we also have our Tentacle of the Deeps. So on our bonus action, we can have our Tentacle reach out and hit them. And if it does hit them, then they are going to have their speed reduced by 10. So we can push them back 10. And then if they, let's say, have a 30 feet movement, we can also reduce their speed to 20 feet. So here we go. This is going to be really cool working with our Tentacle of the Deeps and our Eldritch Blast. Now, as a second level warlock, we do get to add another first level spell. And I went with Expeditious Retreat. I wanted to go with a little bit of utility, just in case. Now, do keep in mind that Demira, as a Fathomless Warlock, does have a swimming speed of 40 feet. And Expeditious Retreat reads as following. It's a bonus action, concentration up to 10 minutes. And this spell allows you to move at an incredible pace. When you cast this spell, and then as a bonus action on each of your turns until the spell spell ends, you can take the dash action. So with normal movement, let's say 30 feet, we can use a bonus action to dash, which means we can move another 30 feet, and then we can use our action to dash. So we're going to move 90 feet. Now, if we're in the water with that swimming speed of 40 feet, we can go 40 feet using our movement, 40 feet with expeditious retreat, the bonus action, and another 40 feet using another dash action as our action for a total of 120 feet swimming speed per turn. So that's really cool. We are quite the swimmer indeed. <laughs> that's all for us at level two. Let's advance our character up to level three. So here we are back on D&D Beyond with our level three Fathomless Warlock, Demira. Now at level three, we get to choose our pact. And what our pact is, is our otherworldly patron has bestowed a gift upon us for our loyal service. And the one that I have chosen for Demira is going to be the Pact of the Talisman. Your patron gives you an amulet, a talisman that can aid the wearer when the need is great. When the wearer fails an ability check, they can add a d4 to the roll, potentially turning a roll into a success. This benefit can be used a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and all expended uses are restored when you finish a long rest. Now, this does say the wearer, so I do believe if we wanted to have one of our allies wear this for a time being, that they would also get the benefit. But knowing Demira, she's going to probably keep the this for herself. Now I did pick the pack that the talisman over the other three. The blade doesn't really fit the fathomless warlock. The pack that the chain focuses on a familiar and I think we have enough going on already with the summoning spells that we'll get at later levels and our tentacle of the deeps which we're going to be using with our bonus action during combat all of the time. The only one that actually came close was the pack of the tome to get some more spells but I really like the pack of the talisman and I think it's going to fit this character very well. So so now as a third level warlock, our packed spells, we still only get two of them per short rest, but they are the equivalent of second level spells. So any of our spells that we can upcast now can be upcast to the second level. And the second level spell that I chose is Mirror Image. So with Mirror Image, this is a very good defensive spell that gives us three images and it makes us harder to hit, whether that's in melee combat or with some type of ranged attacks. Now it's going to be up to you and the campaign that you're playing in up to third level if you're not really targeted that much as a warlock then you might not want to go with this defensive spell mirror image but you may want to choose something with a little bit more utility such as invisibility that's one of my favorite spells that could help in non-combat scenarios or you could choose silence silence is also a good spell especially if you're up against a lot of other magic users or if you require it for stealth but usually mirror image is a good choice if you find yourself needing that extra defense. So that's all I have for us at level three. Let's advance our character up to level four and get that ability score improvement or that fourth level feat. So here we are back on D&D Beyond with Demira, our Fathomless Warlock. Now at fourth level, I am going to choose a feat and I want one that is going to increase our charisma by one so we can up our modifier from plus three to plus four with a 18 charisma. And usually I would choose Fey Touch because of Misty Step, one of my favorite spells in the game. But since we're playing a Shatterkai Elf, we basically already have the Misty Step with our racial ability. So this time I'm going to choose Telekinetic. And this again is 
going to raise our charisma by one, and we're also going to learn the Mage Hand cantrip. And in fact, we can cast our Mage Hand without verbal or somatic components, and we can make our Spectral Hand invisible. Now, instead of making invisible, if we want people to see it, I would probably go more of a flavor of having it appear as a tentacle or something from the deep or something along those lines, but I really do like the fact that we can cast it without verbal and somatic components and we can make it invisible. Now, in addition to the Mage Hand cantrip, as a bonus action, we can try to telekinetically shove one creature that we can see within 30 feet of us. When we do so, the target must succeed on a strength saving throw or be moved 5 feet towards us or away from us, and a creature can willingly fail this save. Now, I really like this feat with regards to the theme of our character. Again, we're going to try to manipulate movement and being able to push or pull creatures towards us or away from us. So, with the telekinetic a kinetic shove it does require a bonus action so i don't think i would take away from tentacle of the deeps with as far as our bonus action in combat but i kind of really like this as a action outside of combat maybe in some type of a role-playing scenario where someone is sitting at a bar and we want to just shove them off of a stool or something like that but of course if we do use it in combat we can also use this against an ally perhaps so that they can get away without having that attack of opportunity we can shove them five feet away from whoever they're in melee combat with and then they can run for it on their next turn so this feat definitely gives us quite a bit. We have the Mage Hand, we have the Telekinetic Shove, and we also get that plus one modifier to our Charisma, giving us a Charisma of 18. And as you can see here, if we go to our Attack Options, our Eldritch Blast is now at a plus six, and it's going to do a D10 plus four of Force Damage. And that is because of our Invocation, the Agonizing Blast. In addition to that, our Tentacle of the Deep's ability also uses our spell attacks, so it is also at a plus six. Now at fourth level, we also get an additional second level spell, and I have chosen Gust of Wind. A line of strong wind 60 feet long and 10 feet wide blasts from you in a direction you choose for the spell's duration. Each creature that starts its turn in the line must succeed on a strength saving throw or be pushed 15 feet away from you in a direction following the line. Any creature in the line must spend two feet of movement for every one foot it moves when trying to get closer to you. Now, we can also use the gust of wind to disperse gases or vapors. It's going to extinguish candles, torches, and similar unprotected flames. And as a bonus action on our turn, we can also change the direction in which the line or the gust of wind is blasting from us. So I really like this spell because it's on theme with our character. We're able to manipulate movement or push creatures back or things along those lines, but I also like that it can be used in non-combat ways, maybe to disperse a fog or some type of gas or vapor. But again, similar to when we chose Mirror Image, you may find yourself at this point, which is fourth level, needing a spell like Invisibility or Silence or something else with a little bit better utility. So don't be afraid to take those, but if you have something that you just want to throw in there and give it a try, then perhaps Gust of Wind is for you. But that's all I have for this level. It's time to move some spells around, and we're going to do that at level 5. So here we are at level 5 with our Fathomless Warlock, Demira. Now, a lot of things are happening at level 5. The first of which is our proficiency bonus is now a plus 3. And as we take a look at our attacks, such as Eldritch Blast is a plus 7. And our Tentacle of the Deeps is also a plus 7. And of course, we're doing a D8 plus 4 of cold damage with that and a D10 plus 4 of force damage with our Eldritch Blast. Speaking of our Eldritch Blast, it has a clause that says this spell creates more than one beam when you reach higher levels. So we're going to have two beams at fifth level. So, so the way that this will work when you run this in combat is you will make your first attack with a plus seven and then you'll make a second attack with a plus seven. So you basically get two attacks with your Eldritch Blast. Now the damage and the effects of each Eldritch Blast beam is what's going to make playing this character so much fun. So we get two attacks and each attack is going to do a D10 plus four points of damage. That's from the Agonizing Blast, giving us that plus four from our Charisma modifier. Then with Repelling Blast, each beam would push a creature back 10 feet away from us, and they are not allowed a saving throw. So if we hit with our first beam, they take a D10 plus four of damage and get pushed back 10 feet. And if we hit with our second beam, they get pushed back another 10 feet and take another 
d10 plus 4 of damage. And with that in mind, let's take a look at our newest Eldritch Invocation because we do get a select one at level 5. And I have picked Lance of Lethargy. So once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with your Eldritch Blast, you can reduce that creature's speed by 10 feet until the end of your next turn. So now if we hit at least once, we can use the Lance of Lethargy and that creature's speed is going to be reduced by 10 feet until the end of our next turn. Now it doesn't matter if we hit with both Eldritch Blasts or just one of them, it's only going to work once on our turn. So only that 10 feet. But let's not forget that as a bonus action, we have our Tentacles of the Deep attack. And if our Tentacle also hits that same creature, then the Tentacle is going to reduce that creature's speed by 10 feet. So on our turn, we can do 2d20 plus 8 of damage. We can push a creature back 20 feet and reduce their speed by 20 feet. This is fantastic and a lot of fun at 5th level. Next, let's take a look at our spells. Now, just as a reminder, as a warlock, we do not get a lot of spell slots. And at the current level, 5th level, all the way up through 10th, we're only going to have two of them, even though they refill after a short rest. Now, those two spell slots are now going to be 3rd level spells. So it doesn't matter what spell we cast, 1st, 2nd, or 3rd, they're going to be cast as a 3rd level spell. So the way that I'm looking at things is why not start replacing some of those lower level spells with some third level spells and higher as we progress through the levels, of course. So what I'm going to do at this level, each character class has a spell casting ability that usually lets them replace one of their existing spells for a new spell whenever they gain a level. So at fifth level, Demira is going to choose a new spell that will be a third level spell. And then she's going to replace one of her existing spells with a new third level spell. So let's take a look at the spell that we get for fifth level. And the one that I chose is Hunger of Hadar. So what this is, is we're going to open a gateway to the dark between the stars, a region infested with unknown horrors. A 20-foot radius sphere of blackness and bitter cold appear, centered on a point within range and lasting for the duration. And our range on this is really good. It's a 150 feet. It's going to require concentration up to one minute. Now this void is going to be filled with a cacophony of soft whispers and slurping noises that can be heard up to 30 feet away. No light, magical or otherwise, can illuminate the area and creatures fully within the area are blinded. To add on to this, the void creates a warp in the fabric of space and the area is difficult terrain. And just as a reminder, difficult terrain, terrain if you're running through it at 30 feet of movement, you can only go 15 feet. Any creature that starts its turn in the area is going to take 2d6 of cold damage. And any creature that ends its turn in the area must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or take 2d6 of acid damage as milky otherworldly tentacles rub against it. So right there at that very last line, milky otherworldly tentacles rub against it. That is horrible horrifying to even think about. I would not want to be trapped inside of the sphere. No way. Absolutely not. But what is going to be really cool and what we're setting up with this character is remember, we have a repelling blast on our Eldritch Blast. So that means anytime we hit a creature, it pushes him 10 feet. We get two beams at fifth level. So if we hit twice, we can push a creature 20 feet back. So if a creature is engulfed inside of this Hunger of Hadar, this 20 foot sphere, and they come out 10 feet, we can hit them with our Eldritch Blast and push them back inside of that sphere. So we could potentially just keep them inside that sphere and it is just going to eat them alive. This is absolutely devastating, especially if we're concentrating on one creature. Now, I also believe that no one can see inside of this, not even if they can, if a character could see within magical darkness because it's just a black sphere. It doesn't say anything about darkness on this, but do correct me if I'm wrong by leaving a comment below. Let me know what you think. Can a creature with magical darkness or devil sights 
or something like that see within the hunger of Hadar. I'm thinking the only thing that can see within it is some creature with blindsight, but this is going to be a devastating combo for our foes. Again, this big old sphere, and we're going to use our Eldritch Blast with that Repelling Blast to keep pushing creatures back inside of it and letting these tentacles from our patron, Rexiel the Risen Deep, take care of the rest. Oh yeah, and let's not forget that our Eldritch Blast also has the Lethargy, so it will reduce their speed by 10, and our Tentacle can reduce their speed by 10, so they're going to be in that sphere for a long time. Now that seems like a lock for what we want to do in combat, but there's one more fun option, and I can see just doing these all the time, and this is Summon Shadow Spawn. So this is going to be a third level Conjuration spell. You call forth a shadowy spirit. It manifests in an unoccupied space that you can see within range. The corporeal form uses a shadow spirit stat block. When you cast this spell, choose an emotion, fury, despair, or fear. The creature resembles a misshapen biped marked by the chosen emotion, which determines certain traits of its stat block. The creature disappears when it drops to zero hit points or when the spell ends. Now, this is the most important part of this. The creature is an ally to you and your companions in combat. The creature shares your initiative count, but takes its turn immediately after yours. It obeys your verbal commands and no action required by you. This is extremely important because with our tendrils of the deeps, that is going to be taking our bonus action to move it around and to, to slap a other creatures or opponents to give them that that minus 10 on their move speed so with the shadow spawn that we have summoned we don't have to use our bonus action to command them and that is going to make for a really fun turn in combat so we're going to have our shadow spawn that's attacking we're going to have our tendrils of the deeps that it's attacking and at we're also going to be hitting with our Eldritch Blast. We're, we're a powerhouse right now. This fifth level character is going to be a lot of fun in combat. So now we have three different options when we bring this Shadow Spirit in. And, you, and again, here you can see this is a pretty tough creature. It's going to be an armor class of 14 and hit points 35 at our current level. Resistance to necrotic damage and, be, and the frightened condition. It's going to have dark vision. Um, all kinds of different things, but where we want to be is we're going to have the Despair Shadow Demon, and that is because of this ability called the Weight of Sorrow. Any creature other than you that starts its turn within five feet of the spirit has its speed reduced by 20 feet until the start of that creature's next turn. So again, we're playing on that theme of manipulating speed and movement. And this spell here, the Shadow Spirit, is going to fall right into where we want it. And I absolutely love both of these spells. Let me know in the comments below, what, what do you like better? The, the Hunger of Hadar, where we're pushing them inside of this, this tentacle-filled darkness? Or do you like the, the Shadow Spawn? And we have our Shadow Spawn, our Tendrils of the Deep, we have all kinds of different things going on. Uh, either way, this is a lot of fun in combat for our Fathomless Warlock. So that's all I have for us at level 5. Let's advance to level 6 and see what new Fathomless Warlock abilities we're going to obtain. So here we are back on D&D Beyond with Demira, our 6th level Fathomless Warlock. Now if you remember, we received the Tentacle of the Deeps feature and the Gift of the Sea for our Shatterkai Warlock at first level. Now at sixth level, we get two more abilities for the Fathomless Warlock. And the first one is Oceanic Soul. You are now even more at home in the depths. You gain resistance to cold damage. In addition, when you are fully submerged, any creature that is also fully submerged can understand your speech and you can understand theirs. So again, we chose the Shatter Kai to get some abilities that aren't going to be defaulted to like a Triton or a Water Genasi. So now Demira's presence underwater is even better. We're going to get that cold damage resistance and we can actually talk underwater with someone that can understand us. That's pretty cool. Our, our conversations with Rexiel when we meet our patron should be pretty interesting. The second sixth level ability we get for being a Fathomless Warlock is Guardian Coil. Your tentacle of the deeps can defend you and others, interposing itself between them and harm. When you or a creature you can see takes damage while within 10 feet of the tentacle, you can use your reaction to choose one of those creatures and reduce the damage to that creature by 1d8. 
And then when we reach 10th level, that will be a 2d8. So our Tentacle of the Deep is quite the class defining feature. Just as a quick recap, we can summon the Tentacle a number of times per day equal to our proficiency bonus. And here at level six, that would be three times per day. It has a 10 foot reach on its attacks and it'll make those attacks with a plus seven and it'll cause a d8 plus four of cold damage. And not only that, but it's going to reduce a creature's movement speed by 10 feet. Now this tentacle is going to last for one minute and as a bonus action on our turn we can move it up to 30 feet and make it another attack. And then here at 6th level we get this cool ability to use the tentacle as a reaction to help reduce damage. So the tentacle of the deeps is just a fascinating and versatile ability of the Fathomless Warlock and you can see why we are concentrating on it. it it's just so much fun. Now moving on to our spell selection for 6th level, we do get to add an additional spell, but I've also chosen to drop one of our previous spells to pick up an additional spell. And the spell that I decided to drop was Gust of Wind. And taking the place of Gust of Wind is going to be Lightning Bolt. So a stroke of lightning forming a line 100 feet long and 5 feet wide blasts out from you in a direction you choose. Each creature in the line must make a dexterity saving throw and a creature takes 8d6 lightning damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. So with our character being able to reduce the speed or movement of other creatures and be able to move them around, maybe we can line up more than one to be able to catch the brunt of this lightning bolt. But lightning bolt really doesn't need a lot of explanation. Sometimes you just need to fry some marshmallows. Now, while I always feel it's necessary to have a big damage dealing spell such as lightning bolt, Sleet Storm is going to provide its own type of havoc. So this is a fourth level spell that's going to require concentration for a minute and it's going to read as follows. Until the spell ends, freezing rain and sleet fall in a 20 foot tall cylinder with a 40 foot radius centered on a point you choose within range. The area is heavily obscured and exposed flames in the area are doused. The ground in the area is covered with slick ice making it difficult terrain. When a creature enters the spell's area for the first time or on a turn or starts its turn there, it must make a dexterity saving throw and on a failed save it's going to fall prone. If a creature starts its turn in the spell's area and it's concentrating on a spell, the creature must make a successful constitution saving throw against your spell save DC or lose concentration. Now, we don't even have to really mention the fact that this is a 20 foot tall cylinder. So anything that is flying in this heavily obscured ice is going to have some problems. But where this is really going to shine is setting up this sleet storm with this ground of ice and using our Eldritch Blast on the next few turns to push them back with that repelling blast or to reduce their movement. There could be a spellcaster that's not currently in the sleet storm, but then we can push them into it and they'll need to make that dexterity saving throw to try not to fall prone. And then they'll need to make that constitution saving throw to try to keep concentration if they're concentrating on a spell. So the sleet storm itself creating this difficult terrain and the slowed movement is damaging enough for the enemy. But the fact that we can use our Eldritch Blast to push more of them into it, that's going to be a lot of fun. So that's all I have for us at level 6. It's time to level up to level 7. So Demira is now a very powerful level 7 Shatterkai Fathomless Warlock. And we're going to get our next Eldritch Invocation and a 4th level spell. So the invocation that I chose is Grasp of Hadar. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with your Eldritch Blast, you can move that creature in a straight line 10 feet closer to you. So now with our Eldritch Blast, we have the Repelling, where we can push someone 10 feet back. We have the Lance of Lethargy, where we can reduce their speed by 10 feet. And now we have Grasp of Hadar, where we can bring them 10 feet closer. I think it's important, so if someone is standing on the outside of a, one of our effects, maybe the far side of it, we can use our Eldritch Blast to bring them in. And we can just manipulate where they're standing. Maybe we want to move an enemy into melee combat with our fighter our barbarian so we could just use our movement 30 feet to get in the correct position cast our eldritch blast and if we hit at least one of the two times we can move them 10 feet closer to us which might put them in direct contact with one of our frontline fighters so this will be a lot of fun and now we have 
full control of movement of our enemies. I, I love it. Now, the fourth level spell that I chose is Rulotham Psychic Lance. This does not require concentration, and it does take one action. You unleash a shimmering lance of psychic power from your forehead at a creature that you can see within range. Alternatively, you can utter a creature's name. If the name target is within range, it becomes the spell's target even if you can't see it. If the named target isn't within the range, the lance dissipates without effect. Now, the target must make an intelligence saving throw. On a failed save, the target's going to take 7d6 of psychic damage and is going to be incapacitated until the start of your next turn. And of course, on a successful save, then the creature is only going to take half as much damage and is not incapacitated. So a few things that stand out to me and why I selected this spell is that it requires an intelligence saving throw. It targets one creature and does 76 psychic damage, which is really good. And it incapacitates them for an entire turn till the beginning of our next turn. So that's going to give advantage and crit hits to our melee uh, fighters that are up on the front line if they're within range. But in addition to all that, it can also target someone if we know their name. So if you remember, we have the Hunger of Hadar spell where it's an obscured area. We have our Sleet Storm spell with which is a heavily obscured area. But if this individual that we're targeting, if we know who it is, maybe it's a villain that we know their name is Lizardo or whatever it have be, then we can just say their name in addition to casting this spell and it's going to hit them in those obscured areas. So we won't have to have a line of sight. And with a range of 120 feet, that should that should do the trick. And if we watched the villain turn invisible and they're just starting to get away, as long as we know their name, we'll be able to get them as well. So an interesting spell that definitely fits our character. So that's all I have for level 7. Let's move up to level 8 and see what's next in store. So here we are back on D&D Beyond, and I've decided to combine levels 8 and 9 for Demira, our Shatterkai Fathomless Warlock. Now at level 8, we get an ability score improvement, and I was really tempted to take our charisma from 18 to 20. That would give us a plus 5, max that out, and increase a lot of our abilities plus our attacks. But I couldn't help myself, and I ended up going with a feat that's going to give us an additional Eldritch Invocation. And the feat that I ended up going with is Protection of the Talisman. When the wearer of your talisman fails a saving throw, they can add a d4 to the roll, potentially turning the save into a success. The benefit can be used a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and all expended uses are restored when you finish a long rest. So a neat little feature, I thought about getting Eldritch Mind where it would help give advantage on concentration constitution saving throws but this one is a little bit more rounded and since we are a pact of the talisman i thought we'd give this a try now at level nine we do get to choose another eldritch invocation and so i chose the other talisman one rebuke of the talisman when the wearer of your talisman is hit by an attacker that you can see within 30 feet of you you can use your reaction to deal psychic damage to the attacker equal to your proficiency bonus and push it up to 10 feet away from the talisman's wearer. So if we are wearing our talisman and we are hit, we can push an enemy back 10 feet. But I think this works even better if we give our talisman to one of our allies and we can see them out there on the front lines. Maybe it's a fighter or someone, uh, something along that line and they get hit and we can use our reaction and our talisman to push that enemy 10 feet away from our ally that is wearing our ornament. And I, I, I just thought it'd be really cool since we are packed of the talisman to pick up a few of those talisman eldritch invocations. Be sure to let me know in the comments below what would you have done at eighth level with your ability score improvement, and what would you do at ninth level with getting another eldritch invocation? There was so many to choose from; it, it was hard to pick, but I, I like this one because it's on theme for our character. Now, speaking of that plus four proficiency bonus, we do have that at level nine and that adjusts our attacks to a plus eight and all kinds of things across the board. So we are really getting up there in terms of power level, but we also get two spells. So we're going to be able to choose a spell at eighth level and choose a spell at ninth level. Now, the spell that I chose at 8th level is a 4th level conjuration spell called Dimension Door. Now, as a reminder, we are Shatterkai, so we can use our bonus action to pretty much misty step 30 feet. But if we really need to get the hell out of the way, 
then we can cast Dimension Door. This is going to require an action and we can go up to 500 feet away. But not only that, but we can take someone with us. So if we really need to get the hell out of there, Dimension Door is probably going to save our ass. Now the 5th level spell, or the spell that I took at ninth level, which opens us up to 5th level spells, is Wall of Light. A shimmering wall of bright light appears at a point you can see within range. The wall appears in any orientation, orientation you choose, horizontally, horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. It can be free-floating, or it can rest on a solid surface. The wall can be up to 60 feet long, 10 feet high, and 5 feet thick. The wall blocks line of sight, but creatures and objects can pass through it. It emits bright light out to 120 feet and dim light for an additional 120 feet. When the wall appears, each creature in its area needs to make a constitution saving throw and on a failed save, a creature takes 48 radiant damage and is blinded for one minute. And then on a successful save, they'll take half as much and are not blinded. Now blinded creatures can make constitution saving throws at the end of their turn to end the effect. And of course, a creature that ends its turn in the wall's area takes 48 radiant damage. So again, this is another of area of effect spell that we can manipulate with our Eldritch Blasts, with our Tendrils of the Deep, with our reactions, and just push and pull and move creatures into places where we want them to take damage. And Wall of Light is going to be one of those resources along with the Hunger of Hadar and the Sleet Storm, that's going to work to our advantage. And, and do keep in mind, we still only have two spell slots per short rest. So it's nice to have a lot of options when it comes time to use one of those two spell slots. Well, that's all I have for us at levels eight and nine. Let's advance the mirror up to level 10 and get some new Fathomless Warlock abilities. So here we are at level 10 with our Fathomless Warlock and we get an ability called Grasping Tentacles. You learn the spell Evard's Black Tentacles. It counts as a Warlock spell for you, but it doesn't count against the number of spells you know. You can also cast it once without a spell slot and you regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. Whenever you cast this spell, your patron's magic bolsters you, granting you a number of temporary hit points equal to your warlock level. Moreover, damage cannot break your concentration on this spell. So this is amazing. Now, at 10th level Warlock, we don't gain any extra spells. So being able to get Avard's Black Tentacles at this level is definitely a blessing. So for those of you unfamiliar, this is actually a 4th level spell. And it reads, Squirming Ebony Tentacles fill a 20-foot square on a ground that you can see within range. For the duration, these tentacles turn the ground in the area into difficult terrain. When a creature enters the affected area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there, the creature must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or take 3d6 bludging damage and be restrained by the tentacles until the spell ends. A creature that starts its turn in the area and is already restrained by the tentacles is going to take 3d6 of bludgeoning damage. A creature restrained by the tentacles can use its action to make a strength or dexterity check, its choice against your spell save DC, and on a success, it's going to free itself. So this is the top of the pile of what we want. Any type of spell that says when a creature begins its turn or enters into the first time is exactly what we want to have as far as being a Fathomless Warlock because we're going to use our Eldritch Blast and our Tentacles of the Deep and our other abilities to be able to manipulate their movement, slow them down, push them back, move them forward to be able to put them in that area. And what's cool about the Grasping Tentacles ability is we get Evard's Black Tentacles. We actually get one free use of it which is fantastic since we still only have the two spell slots. And we're going to gain 10 temporary hit points. And you can't beat that. 10 temporary hit points is pretty darn good. And to complete our level advancement to level 10, we also get a cantrip and I chose lightning lure. So this is going to be a lash of lightning that's going to strike out to a creature within 15 feet of us. And they're going to take 2d8 of lightning damage and be pulled 10 feet towards us in a straight line, of course, if they fail a strength saving throw. So it's going to tie right into our theme of manipulating movement. So I think we can stop there. There's a lot of great things going on with Demira all the way up to 10th level. And at 11th level, her abilities are only going to get more powerful. 
So I really enjoyed putting this together with trying to find a way to create difficult terrain, to manipulate movement, to push, to shove, to reduce movement speed, and all of the things. I really love the Fathomless Warlock, the Tendrils of the Deep, and all the spells that we chose. There's a lot of great flavor and theme going on with our Shatterkai Warlock, Demira. So what did you think of this character build? Is this something that you would play in your game? And if so, what would you do differently? And did I get any of the rules wrong? Because I usually do. Be sure to leave a comment below and let me know what you're thinking. Thank you very much for watching and on to the next.